Now, to begin with, a convoy of an advanced security team of Speaker Alban Bagbin has been involved in an accident, leading to the death of a dispatch rider. The team was headed to Wa to await the arrival of the Speaker. A vehicle allegedly ran into the convoy in Konongo, leading to the death of the rider. Kate Addo is Director of Public Affairs in Parliament, and she joins us via phone. Thanks for your time. What information have you received on this incident so far? Um, the incident that you report is true. And um, um, the speaker's advanced team, speaker has a program in WA in the Upper East Region um, this weekend. And so he's scheduled to leave tomorrow. Um, so as is um, the usual uh, practice, an advanced team instead of today to go and prepare the grounds for him. Um, when the team got to Konongo, um, the rider had stopped a truck uh, to enable the team to pass. Um, unfortunately, a speeding vehicle came from behind and hit him. His motorcycle caught fire, and unfortunately, we lost the rider. Mm. That's very unfortunate. Um, it is very unfortunate. What, what, so where is the speaker now? The speaker is actually at work at the moment uh, receiving guests that were scheduled to be a guest to call on him today. The speaker, I am, I'm going to is safe. He is here in a crowd with us, as can be understood. He's very distraught about uh, the loss of a rider that's been with us um, from 2009. Mm. Um, very, very experienced um, rider, very respectful and very dependable. And so, as can be imagined, we all here are not just sad, but also shocked at the sudden uh, turn of events that has led to the loss of his uh, rather precious life. Has his family been contacted? Um, I cannot tell you that yet. But, uh, um, well, well, I mean, I'm sure they would have heard by now. But I, can't, I cannot confirm that yet. Everything has happened okay. in a rush, and we're trying to gather ourselves. And unfortunately, as can be imagined, um, it's already in the media space. And so we are having to deal with it from, from that angle. How does this affect the speaker's security detail and the trip tomorrow? I mean, obviously, everybody's shaking. We don't know yet that the speaker's final decision is going to do, but uh, everybody's shaking, and uh, it, this is not the kind of news that you want to wake up to. So they're trying to, you know, gather the pieces and, and move on, but... Uh, as can be imagined, this is not an easy, easy news to hear at all, mm. especially for somebody of his stature and, and, and caliber. Thank you very much, Kate Addo, for joining us. She's Director of Public Affairs in Parliament. Also this afternoon, there is huge vehicular traffic both in, on both the in and outbound sides of the Tema motorway after a 40-footer trailer caught fire in the middle of the road towards Tema. The fire service has successfully doused the flames, but the police are unable to tow the vehicle because the head of the trailer is completely burnt in a manner that would not allow for towing. The police personnel on the scene also say they did not meet the driver or any person in the vehicle. My colleague Kwekwa Sante is there and joins us via Zoom. First of all, Kwekwa, tell us how bad the situation is in terms of the traffic jam on the motorway. All right, Daniel. So, you know, the Tema Motorway is supposed to be an expressway. Vehicular traffic is expected to be moving up and down quite easily. But that is not a situation. I'll try and turn my camera up one second for you to be able to see the situation. The traffic situation is very terrible, both in the in and outbound parts of the Tema Motorway. The vehicles are moving at a very slow pace because of this trailer that has the head bent completely. And so the police who I met on the scene says, they do not know exactly what happened. They are trying to investigate. But the fire service, like you said, have been here. They've been able to doubt the, the flame completely. But there are still smoke that is still coming out of the vehicle. There's currently no police personnel on the ground. There's no fire service. There's no security detail here. Even as smoke still trickles out from the head of mm. this 40 footer trailer mm. here on the motorway, Daniel. Are there any specific steps the police has taken? to identify the owner or driver of the vehicle? Right, so the police say when they arrived here, the police, uh, the owner or the driver of the vehicle was not in the vehicle. So they tried to throw away the vehicle, but because the head is completely bent in a way that doesn't make it possible to tow, 
the towing vehicle that was here has just moved away. And what the police said, they expect is that they can be able to change the head or detach the head and just be able to move the body and be able to take it away. Because as of now, it is affecting vehicular traffic both on both, on both, on both sides. And so mm. they are trying to locate the driver by also taking the, uh, the, the, num the number plate details and trying to run checks from the driver and vehicular license and authority to be able to identify the owner and contact them. Now, what are they also going to do about this trailer? Obviously, as you say, it's impeding the free flow of traffic on the motorway. Right. So, they are expecting... Right, Kweku. Kweku, I lost you there for a moment. They, if are, you can... they, they, are, they are expecting to detach the head of the trailer and move the body so that they can be able to open up the space for vehicular traffic to move freely. Mm. Because, Nancy, thank you very much for bringing us those updates from the Accra Terma motorway. Now, nine people have been arrested following renewed violent clashes between two feuding factions of the Teshi Traditional Council. On Thursday night, the palace of the Teshi Wulomo, Numo Bedu Odano Odiapensa I, was attacked by armed men who set two other houses on fire. In 2019, the legitimacy of the Wulomo was challenged in court in a case which is yet to be determined. The legal proceedings have, however, not prevented those clashes. John Ajete speaks for the Wulomo. ...of the Teshi people, the Wulomo represents the spiritual authority um, of the people. Well, last night, um, his palace was attacked, and behind me you can see shattered um, glasses of the door and remnants of, uh, you know, ties which were bent from here, giving an indication of um, what indeed happened uh, last night, we're told that um, a long-standing, um, if you like, disagreement and chieftaincy dispute within the community was really the reason this happened. There are two factions, we're told. There were sporadic shootings last night resulting in the injury um, of one person. We're also told that um, about nine people have been picked up by the police and have been transferred to um, the Accra region um, headquarters. But I'm told that this gentleman was here um, yesterday when it all um, happened. Shoot. What he's telling me is that um, four people charged at him last night um, while he was still eating and you could still see the bow here um, with Kinky um, Husk here. Uh, and, and he tells me that um, when they came, they were wielding guns and one of them whose name he mentions as Ata um, gave an order for the remaining of the other ones to shoot and then they began shooting sporadically so he told this other gentleman who's standing right here was also here at the time to move into uh, the house and so they did move into the house you know th this table is bent and this one is also giving an indication of um, the bending i'll speak to the um, spokesperson of the Wulomo here, um, John Ajete. Uh, grateful that you could speak to us. Uh, the the Wulomo's house was attacked. Exactly. We were just told that there are four men who came here and began shooting and bent down. The area. What's really the reasoning? Do you have any suspicion for um, this happening? Okay, so he has started the rituals for the Wulomo celebrations. In fact, he started somewhere last month. So he's preparing for the on the ninth event. And they are making all effort to create chaos so that he will be prevented from performing what traditionally belongs to him. And when you say he's preparing to perform something, what is he preparing to perform? That is the ban on drumming and noise making. We call it Bemin La. And that is the, the commencement of the Homo Festival. That is the ritual that. Sake Nonisa, to Sake Agbala. Sike Abana me ni amenye ma ne mie be intention ni o ma mie agbele be e fe mo sika ke mu gweti na kleti tete ye fo ite ye se na ke ma ne mi ba jo sika na kanu go nye ba ke na kanu go nye ba mi ni be ni o wa na amenye ma ne mie agbele ko na mu ko 
keke e sa fe mu ba gbe ma de san ito no onu ni sa ka fe government won pa government en fa ni e ke na ni amashi ye ma ni mi ko ni no ni train dole baba ni e ke train dole baba because ke mu ko ya mu ko ya fe no ko e ka mu le biru ana e biru ana enye ma ni mi keke person o mi e ke fe no ko e anye mi no 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 ko afi no won pa government en fa no ni ba e ke na ni amashi won pa le fa wa e ke na ni amashi he wraps up by saying, in fact, calling on government to make sure that the perpetrators of this um, particular crime are brought to book. It makes reference to previous incidents which had happened, but the culprits were found, even after being arrested, were found to be walking freely on the streets. He says this must not be a repetition of that. We we'll just go out and speak to the people about how safe they feel and... Uh, uh, you know, after this incident, has become, as it will be, one too many uh, of the of the attacks on the um, the palace and then the people here in. The parliament of Kamomukwe, I got jailed. All the forty years, fifty years, they are me. Only me, because none none are no be an test ever to move. I feel no guy say goodbye. Feel no one go. No I feel. No, ni no, 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 Tawa yafi ni mami to na me nu amese dana wa yafi shaka wa lau sweto komo ni bi na fite maba Now Manuel also spoke to some police personnel on the latest development Fire Currently we've arrested nine persons who are in police custody assisting in investigations What do we know about these people who are They are currently um, they are the, the identity I cannot talk much about, but in course of investigation, it will be very clear for us to know the brain behind the attack. We understand one person has been shot. Uh, the police also retrieve empty shells at the scene. All these things will aid police investigations to establish the brain behind the attack. No, currently, the police have not retrieved any gun. Where, where, where did the police arrest them? Where exactly? We understand they were hiding in one of the uh, uh, a faction. That is, for, yeah, that is what we understand the police when they, they got them arrested. How is the person who, is, who was shot, how is the person doing? Do we know the identity of the person, male, female? Uh, it's a male. Currently, they've been issued with medical forms and they are being treated at the hospital. But tell me, um, we, we've spoken to some of the residents there who say this is not the first time such an attack is happening. It's happened before and some of the perpetrators were arrested, uh, were eventually released and, and punished. What will be your response to that? Sir? Currently, what I can say, there's a heavy police deployment there to ensure security. So I will urge the residents to remain calm. The police is in control of the situation. I understand the divisional commander is in a serious meeting with opinion leaders in the area. All these are plans in place to ensure that there's uh, security and peace in the area. It's early days yet. Invest investigations will, will prove any other uh, intention behind the attack. Away from that story, a court in Accra has injuncted the ongoing strike action being embarked on by the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG. After an application from the National Labor Commission is when this happened. Now, UTAG is demanding a little over $2,000 as entry-level salary for lecturers. But after unsuccessful negotiations with the government over the demands, the National Labor Commission says this injunction is necessary so that lecturers can return to work whilst negotiations continue. Now, let's go on the phone and speak to the Executive Secretary of the National Labor Commission, Ofusua Samwa, for further details. 
Mr. Asama, thanks for joining us. Why is it necessary to go for an injunction when government could simply continue negotiating with the workers to meet their demands? Yes, it was necessary to go for the uh, order from the court to restrain the university teachers from furthering the industrial action because of one, the government is engaging them on their consent and uh, their own letter to the commission on the fourth of the, the first thing that they were still engaging government in finding a solution to their problem. And the labor law enjoins everyone or every party to a negotiation settlement, mediation, arbitration. But while the process is ongoing, you are not to engage in the strike. Neither, uh, gov neither is government nor employers also to do any form of lockout. Red and banks are prohibited. Any form of intimidation, harassment are also prohibited within the period. Right. So if they are letter to the commission requesting for an adjournment from yesterday the fifth to uh, the tenth or thereafter, if that they are engaging the government and their constituents, then it means that mm. the negotiation mm. process is still going on and mm. therefore they cannot spread. Mm. If you permit it, I will read their own letter to you. Go ahead. If we say this, that's the second paragraph. First acknowledging the importance of your office and the need to honor this all-important obligation. The national leadership of the association is unfortunately unable to attend on the third date and time. Having met representatives of government with the view of finding a solution to the present situation yesterday, the 3rd of August, it has become necessary for leadership to go and consult with our concerns and take a decision on the way forward. This is suggestive of the fact that they are led to government, they are meeting their consciences, they to government, and so on. So the process is ongoing. Right. Within this period, right. you cannot engage in the strike. Now, um, Mr. Ofosa Samoa, isn't this move bad faith being shown by government? If it is, it, it is not bad faith. The bad faith would then come from um, the university students, yeah, sorry, teachers, if I may say. You know, negotiation, when you go for the negotiation, you, the law says you must negotiate in good faith. So good faith will, will not do anything to intimidate the other party. So mm -hmm. if I'm negotiating with you on salary, I am going on strike. It means you either agree to my proposal or this is what happened. They issued a threat already when they brought a letter earlier on that. They'll be going on strike. What is this? So that is intimidating enough. And that alone falls flat on the face of the law. Then the, the National Labor Commission directs them to refrain from that. They disregard the order. We invite them to have the matter settled. They say we are unable to give themselves in their own letter if the decisions are going on. And within the period of negotiation, mm. where they are meeting with government and consulting their council, right. then they proceed to go on strike. Right. So you know three instances I mean, they fall flat on the face of the law. That is why we were compelled to go to the high court. And I'm sure in the wisdom of the court, if they saw that the government was acting in bad they will not grant the order. So where are we currently, Mr. Samoa, on the negotiation with the lecturers? They are still negotiating with government. You see, we as a commission are not part of the negotiation. We are not a party to the negotiation. We facilitate the settlement of issues. And second, if the UTAC or government or both report to the commission that we have hit the end of the road, we are unable to settle through negotiations. Then the commission will either give them a mediator or arbitrator or hear the matter summary. But not when the parties are still negotiating. Mm. Like mm. I said, in their own letter to us, they have met the government on the third, they are meeting their constituency. So they have been told us that they are still the end of the road. So they are still negotiating. If right. they hit the end of the road, it, the parties are enjoined. Either one of them or both, any of them, could report to the commission. And the commission will be seized with the matter and continue. But this has not come. 
So at the time when you are voting to that we are negotiating with government, then you go and declare a strike. No, the law stands on it. And that is why you must not continue. Thank you, Mr. Fosa Sama, for joining us. Now let's take a reaction from the University Teachers Association of Ghana. Professor Charles Marfo is the national president. Prof, thanks for joining us. Has this injunction come to your attention? And what are you going to do about it? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to your listeners. Yes, uh, I just got a, a soft copy through a WhatsApp. And uh, obviously we will refer it to our lawyers and I'm sure they will respond to it. But you see, I've been listening to the executive secretary and sometimes it's sad. I wonder if he also received our letter dated 15 July, notifying them that because of the actions and inactions of government, by 31st July, we'll call on strike. I mean, is he going to did, did they get that letter? Yes. Now, Prof. Malfo, I, I, I'm coming in here because he states yes. that at the time you decided to go on strike, there, were, there was negotiation ongoing with government. Is that the case? <laughs> I, I wonder what they describe as negotiations because uh, we did not tell them a strike. But, senior, what I want to say is if there was even a negotiation and there was a bounce between the express by government, and we have written to you that because of that, we may go on strike on that first July. I think that the, perhaps the least they could have done is to call us at that time, within a space of three, three weeks, before the strike. Mm. Would they have done that? In any case, in any case, the day that we wrote that we cannot meet them and we said we are meeting government, that was not, that was not for negotiation. We were called by government to come and set up uh, some uh, special committee to look at the uh, uh, how they agree, the uh, technical committee, that is the way, technical committee. But when we got there, and government says that I understand you are uh, on strike and I want to make an offer, and an offer which we, we didn't think it is convenient for our members and we reject it. But you see, the, the crust of the matter is this. Knowing that we've been doing this for the past two years, my brother, and we've been always notifying the... Uh, the Labour Commission, including other areas of uh, our negotiation, including the fact that they were government if we want to move mm. our pensions to uh, Smith and all that. Mm. And so it is not only about even our conditional services that we have been engaging the Labour Commission. Mm. But yes, they seem to be doing what they are supposed to do. I mean, uh, sadly, even if you come to uh, the university com community, people are expecting them to follow through. Uh, Follow through with this because uh, yeah. it seems that is all that we know to win. But if right. you could really ask them for me, that if they got a letter proud to the solid on the strike, and why they, couldn't they have called us to discuss it or drawn the attention of government to the fact that mm. they need to be up and do it because as I said, this this might this might this this might happen. Okay. We didn't even get a response to that letter, let alone being called. To, listen to, to be listened to. Now, now Prof. Mafo, if you can um, give me just a moment. Uh, Mr. Fusa Samwa is still on the other line. He wants to respond to some of the issues you've raised. Mr. Samwa, uh, thanks for staying with us. What specifically yes. did you want to speak to? Oh, yes. Uh, Prof. was referring to an earlier letter of the 15th. I think if I heard it was 15th. Uh, 15th July. July, yes. Mm -hmm. So when we received when we received the letter of the 15th July, right, of their complaint, all we did was we wrote to the ministry that we have received a letter from the University Teachers Association of Ghana complaining about the slow pace, they were then complaining about the slow pace at which government was attending to their issue, and that they were going to um, engage in a strike by the 31st, each nothing is done. And then the ministry, that was what prompted the ministry to be holding the regular meetings with them to have the matter settled. And he will agree that from that time, we have met the ministry not less than three or four times. We have met almost a minute. Is okay. that right? Prof, Prof is that so the case? Prof, you, no, no. You bring a complaint. 
Let me get that response from Prof. Mr. Samuel. Since we, we sent that letter, my brother, we have never been called by anybody. And so if they've been meeting government, we don't know that. In any case, we wrote formal letter. Why haven't we been written to formally? Okay. We, we have no idea about what he's talking about. Prof, unfortunately, because of time, we will have to leave the conversation at this point. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you as well to you, Executive Secretary of National Labour Commission, Ofosu Asamwa. Let's move to Parliament. And the embattled Asin North member, James Jachikwesen, says he is still the member of Parliament for the area. The MP was in Parliament to participate in the work of the House, despite a court's ruling that declared his seat vacant. Mr. Quaison participated in a meeting of Parliament's Privileges Committee to deliberate on contempt proceedings against the Central MP Kennedy A. Japong. He told Joy News he's still MP based on processes he has initiated to challenge the ruling. is there, but also there's a, a process that you take uh, after such pronouncements of rulings or whatever, which I have satisfied all the requirements. I'm not going to go into details of that. And so, uh, so long as I know, based on those uh, process that I have also initiated and uh, made sure they are in place, it still uh, gives me that opportunity to stay as a member of parliament for a send note. And for that matter, any committee that I belong to in parliament, which is also extension of parliament, uh, equally uh, binds my membership. So that's why I was in the meeting. I have always said that I a type of individual that respects law and order. Um, I've lived in a country that has always uh, given human rights and privileges to all citizens. So um, being a part of the committee, going back to that is, again, is the law of the land. Meanwhile, Chairman of the Privileges Committee, Joe Osewusu, has confirmed the committee could not get Asin Central MP Kennedy Japong to serve him notice of Thursday's contempt hearing, which is why he couldn't appear before the committee. He says the case against him for thrusting Erastus Asari Donko will resume when Parliament returns from its break, which will begin today. Unfortunately, the committee could not reach the Honourable Member to serve him with the invitation to appear before it today. Nevertheless, the committee took advantage to meet and to discuss our procedure, our remit as a committee, and um, the need to hold as a court, as it is. And so this is the meeting we have had. But in view of the fact that parliament is rising tomorrow, we have deferred the hearing to when Parliament resumes. All that matters is that we know he's here, he's in town. The information we have is that he's out of the country. As soon as we know he's in town, we'll serve him with a notice to appear before the committee. That's oh. all. We specifically requested him not to appear today because it was not practicable in the absence of the respondent. It was not practicable to hold the proceedings. So we sent a message to him that we've not been able to reach the respondent. So it's not possible to start proceedings. So please hold your horses. Don't appear before us today. So we specifically requested him not to come. Away from Parliament, Energy Minister Dr. Matthew poku -Pempe says the ministry is seriously monitoring some staff of the Energy Commission leaking sensitive information to players in the industry who in turn are using it against government. Describing such conduct as unpatriotic and unacceptable, the minister said there will be no hiding place for such individuals. Inaugurating the governing board of the commission responsible for regulation, management and utilization of petroleum resources, the minister charged them to critically examine the local content law and explore ways to allow Ghanaians to participate in the oil sector. My colleague Elton Brobby is there and joins us on phone. Elton, what is informing the minister's concern? Right, so the minister.
register will not go into the details except to say that if as a country we are not happy with the way our oil and gas sector is being done, it means that the regulator is either not strong or not really assertive, and that must change. But mm. of more importance to him is what he described as some staff of uh, the Petroleum Commission because of their relationship with some individuals or some businesses mm. uh, are leaking classified uh, secret or confidential documents uh, to some companies. And these companies are using it uh, right. to get to the country. And this will not continue. According to him, while the country is moving towards a certain direction, these individuals have rather decided to be unpatriotic. And what they are doing is to leak this information uh, that is getting the country. So you want the uh, incoming board to seriously look at it and to face out these individuals and send to them accordingly. He said that if you are doing something that is right, you will not be targeted. But if you are among those who are who become unpatriotic, then the board and management they have every right to push those individuals out and then deal with them. Uh, on the issue of uh, the local content law, I'm very well aware it was passed in 2013, got amended in 2017. The content of the law is to give Ghanaians proper ownership over our oil resources. But what is happening is that because of financial constraints and Ghanaian companies are unable to raise the needed capital to go into exploration mm. and the other business associated with the, with the oil production, we are following it, protecting our oil business. The minister wants us to change. He wants the board to look at ways of fine-tuning the local content law, mm. such that if we have to turn the tables, we must, according to him. And that would mean that getting Ghanaians to be at the forefront and rather going out to make it harder to help exploit our oil base. Okay. And for him, even where we have few Ghanaian companies uh, participating in the oil sector, they've monopolized the system such that it leaves no room for others to join. I and mean, it was to be matters handled uh, as early as possible by the board and ensure that our oil resources benefit Ghanaians. We want to see more Ghanaians turn out to be millionaires. Mm. We want to be measured by how many Ghanaians play active roles in our oil and gas sector. And that is what he's committed to. Elton Brobe, thank you very much for bringing us those updates from the Ministry of Energy. Now, President and Chief Executive for the Institute for Security, Disaster and Emergency Studies, Dr. Ishmael Norman, is urging governments to set up a state department or agency that will deal with marital issues. This, he believes, will help address the increasing rate of divorce in the country. Concerned about the situation and other issues affecting the family unit in Ghana, Dr. Norman penned his thoughts, backed by research, into a book he titled Family Values for Modern Couples. Speaking at the book launch, he was hopeful the nuggets of wisdom would help stem the tide. I think that our country sometimes is way, way, way behind the things that are important for us. In America, in Europe, in most of the European countries, there is a department or ministry that is responsible for marriages and mar marital affairs. U.S. has one, U.K. has one, Germany has one. If the family is the beginning of a nation, then if we don't study the family and the things that are happening in the family, then we really don't understand why we should be called a nation. And so I said, let me write this book. Maybe it will bring the book to completion, that it will help other people. Because we seem to be in a perennial state of shocks and stresses. So the whole point is to build a stronger community that will lead to a stronger country. But it all begins from man and a woman. So that relationship is suffering too much. 50% of all marriages this year will end up in divorces. That is unacceptable situation. Dr. Norman also highlighted the need for parents to strongly collaborate in raising their children in order to bring out the best in them. Sometimes you have to bring your own experiences. I was compelled by circumstances of my father's death at the age of 14 to become a houseboy in my own stepsister's house. Now, these kinds of things don't happen. That your stepsister will say, the condition under which I'll let you come and live with me is if you become the houseboy, because I cannot pay the houseboy and keep you. I mean, how much food was I going to eat? But I agreed to do that job. And it was one of the most important decisions I ever made as a young man because it transformed my life. 
I realized that family is good to have, but if you are not your own man, your own woman, family will disappoint you. And I have understood this message from the age 15. But this whole book is about resilience. How can we build stronger marriages? How can we build stronger unions so that our children will grow up in a noble environment? Because when children grow up where there is mother and father, no matter the financial difficulties, they are happier, they are high performing, and they grow up to be responsible adults. The Live on Joy News today with me, Daniel Dazzi. Time for the latest in business. Let's talk business now and MTN Ghana says it has witnessed a significant reduction in mobile money fraud since the introduction of the no identification, no mobile money in April this year. According to the telecommunications market leader, the directive has assisted its partners, that is its agents, to really identify the customers they are transacting business with. There's more in this report. MTN Ghana expressed satisfaction so far with the implementation of the no ID, no mobile money policy. However, it is worried that some customers are not able to access the Momo service because they've lost their ID cards. Speaking at the launch of the MTN Mobile Money Month, General Manager of MTN Mobile Money Limited, Elihene, said his outfit is in talks with the regulator to enable those who have genuinely lost their ID cards access Momo. He pointed out that the Momo Month has aided policy guidance over the years. We've seen a reduction in the fraud, but more importantly is, is the fact that it's also helped our partners, which are the agents, to, to be more in tune. So that issues that come out of that transaction are very clear because you know who came to do the transaction, you're able to identify the person. Except that we've also received reports uh, from the media and some of our stakeholders that that particular uh, directive is also impacting access to the service because people who have genuinely uh, lost their IDs in different ways are not able to access the service. And so as we speak, Part of the consideration is looking at the process and how to make it better because we do not want a situation where a policy is uh, impacting the adoption of the service. Mr. Haney also said the future of mobile money looks brighter because it continues to drive payment solutions. From all indications, um, the future of Momo looks bright and the focus is to drive uh, payment solutions. And payment solutions because that way and I talked about the, 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 the advantages of trying to digitize our, our uh, financial transactions. Today, with Momo uh, and, and other digital uh, platforms, you don't need to move to make transactions. MTN mobile money transactions constitute more than 80% of total industry Momo transactions. Now, Anglo Gold Ashanti is encouraging high women participation in its annual graduate trainee program for skills empowerment. It supports the development and representation of women in the mines operation and the broader mining industry in Ghana. Managing Director of the Mine, Dr. Eric Isubonting, revealed about 44% of the graduates have been employed fully by the company. Prince Apia was at the graduation of the second batch, which also marked the third batch of the program. The graduate trainee program started in 2019 at the inception of the Obwas Mines Redevelopment. The aim was to bridge the gap between school and work. Tertiary graduates are targeted as trainees and offer technical skills across various disciplines in the mining industry. Wasila Bobie is the Senior Human Relations Manager. For the second year running, trainees who excelled at the end of their first year have been given the opportunity to continue with their learning experience for a second year. To our outgoing graduate trainees, I am certain that your learning experience with Anglegold Ashanti has given you the springboard to compete competitively within the market, the job market, for a rewarding career. She spoke at the graduation ceremony of 10 graduates for the second batch of the program, 
whilst matriculating 14 others for the third batch. Each graduate trainee undertook research and cost-saving projects meant to enhance the mine's business operations. Lois Isidua Ahinkra was adjudged the best trainee of the second batch. So this training program has been a stepping stone. Being part of this training program has actually exposed me in the mining industry. I'm so in any processing plant, one thing we are concerned about is our recoveries. That is what determines how efficient our process is. So in order to improve the recovery, what do we do? And that was the main idea behind my projects. Managing director of the mine, Dr. Eric Subonten says the mine is committed to absorb and implement such projects. You're live on Joy News today with me, Daniel Dazza. For more business news, go on myjoyonline.com forward slash business. But up next is sports. Good afternoon. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News. Today. Now, Ghanaian musician uh, Kwame Yuji says he sees himself as an evangelist spreading uh, good morals. According to him, music is more effective means uh, of evangelism than any other channel. He spoke to Reverend Albert Okan on Springboard. People literally can sing my song from beginning to end. How does it make you feel? It makes me feel good. It makes me feel inspired. Mm. Like, okay, I'm actually doing something good. And it makes me go back to see my lyrics. So I'll probably not put, sorry to say, Chav there to lead people. Because I, I figured a lot of people listen to me. You don't I'm sing profane? I'm, I'm very, very careful because I have all kinds of people listening to my music. I have really old people, very old people listening to my music. I've had videos of old women saying, Kwame Yuji or Hema, Metekwana, BBM. I've had young people sing my music and I've, I've seen very, very little people um, um, vibing to my music and it makes me really think deep when I'm putting lyrics together. How... It's, it's, is this going to affect people out there? Is it going to have good effects or bad effects on people out there? And I try as much as possible to make um, um, the good side of every lyrics that I put out there much bigger and higher than, I mean, how much playful or maybe irrelevant things I'll put in the music. So I try as much as possible to put a message in there. So every music that I put out there has message. I don't just put message there. I try as much as possible as much as possible. That means it's, it's not easy to try and put message in every music you put out there. But then again, I think if this is a music and it's, it's my kind of way to kind of evangelize, that is what I focus on doing because... Evangelize? I yeah, because, I mean, it's, it, it, it's evangelism. I mean... Really? Spreading word.